very good evening to all our viewers and welcome to this week's first edition of the Evening Review. My name is Taiwan Jabela, your host. Let's look at today's front page of Namibian Sun. Tonight uh, on the show, we are joined by uh, Scott Evans. He is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of Recon Africa. That is a company, of course, that is uh, exploring for oil in Namibia, in uh, Kavango East region specifically. Uh, Scott, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for making time to speak to us. Well, thank you for inviting me. And, uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak with your viewers. Lovely, lovely. Let, let, let's start with the, the recent uh, seismic permit granted to your company. Um, just for a layman like myself, what, what does it mean uh, for, for your project? What, what does it entail and what does it, mean, what does it mean in the broader scheme of things? Sure, sure. So um, seismic data are basically sound waves uh, that are generated. They go into the earth and they bounce back up and they're, they're recorded. So that recording is then a, gives us an image of what the subsurface looks like, you know, under, under, the, uh, under the surface of the Earth. And the subsurface of the, you know, looks like the surface in the sense that there's topography. So we get to see hills and valleys and features in the subsurface that'll help us determine where the uh, uh, hydrocarbon traps or accumulations might be. Indeed, and um, just um, the, um, I mean, the, the, this new development, uh, is, it, is it something that gives your company even greater hope that uh, what you are looking for could actually be existing in that area of Namibia? Is, is it uh, another step forward in your search for oil in Namibia? Well, it, it's an absolute next step forward. So we've drilled these two stratigraphic test wells in the Kawe and Bombay area. You know, those are, if you will, very detailed uh, pitch views in a, a, a well bore that's like the size of a tree trunk, a mile down. So we have a very detailed picture of what we see in the rocks from those well bores. Now what the seismic does is it takes a lower fidelity picture, but all the way across. So between the wells and the seismic data, you can get a picture of what's under the entire Kavango area. Now, you know, the seismic data, we originally are shooting 450 kilometers of it. Um, that process is just beginning. We will inevitably see things we like and potentially shoot additional. But the, uh, the bottom line is the seismic data is, is uh, very uh, benign. It's just a single source. We're traveling around existing roads, sending our signals, and having them come back and measure them. Uh, they'll, data will then be processed and interpreted. So that would give us the two pieces we need, you know, a detailed view of what the rocks are saying, and then a broader view across the area that shows us where we might have uh, potential hydrocarbon uh, traps and accumulations. So it's definitely the next step in the exploration process. Now, uh, Scott, uh, um, as we continue, obviously, with that, um, as you continue with your project, you know, you, you've uh, met so much resistance from some sections, uh, sections of society, um, you know, especially the environmental protection people, while, of course, I, I suppose the, the silver lining really has been that uh, the Namibian government uh, has been uh, your biggest supporter in your activities. What can you tell us about environmental protection? There is so much that is being said. A lot of people are not convinced by the messages of frequent Africa. Some say it's a, 
it's a bunch of lies, it's not really true, there's a lot of cover up and stuff like that. Um, what can you tell us on record tonight, uh, tonight uh, Scott, as far as uh, environmental protection is concerned for your project? Yes, yeah, it's very important for the people of Midian to know that we are dedicated to the utmost of, of transparency. So, you know, this process began several years ago to establish the environmental uh, impact assessments and ultimately the ECC for the, the stratigraphic test wells and realize these stratigraphic test wells are just that. They're simply wells that we drill to sample the rocks. Um, we've gone, we know that we are in ecologically sensitive areas. We are working with the government to make sure that we avoid those. You know, the, the, there's several approaches you can take in, 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 into this. We have all the maps, we know where we need to avoid. And we're placing additional measures in protecting the environment, both in our drilling plans our plans for doing the seismic and really using uh, global best practices to make sure that the environment is protected because we have to have you know, uh, the, the faith of the government to continue this operation. Now, in terms of where we drill, remember we're 260 kilometers from the Oak Bank of Delta. We, we have buffer zones around all the major parks, uh, preserves, rivers, uh, Delta itself. So we're going to have setbacks to every place that's considered environmentally sensitive. In addition to making sure that we, when we do have operations, that you're using we're using the best practices available uh, for environmental protection. We we also have, you know, as drillers, uh, we know how we know water. You know, water is, is is critical to life in the area, and it's something as a geologist. I understand very well hydrogeology and hydrogeology are very closely related topics. So we are making sure that we also provide more uh, water wells to the area and that the ones that we use are turned back for use by the people. We're going to be drilling another 16 water wells for the uh, for, uh, communal consumption over the next several months and have uh, everything in place. We have a, a, a large ESG plan. We just announced that we have committed $10 million to ESG. And that's going to be put in place over the next uh, months and years. Hmm. Um, the the Namibian constitution um, has provisions, one of the strongest provisions in the world for environmental protection, and the country is hailed for for that over the years. Uh, I'm just wondering, Scott, how closely, and I know you alluded to it uh, briefly in your last. Uh, response, but how closely are you working uh, with uh, particularly Namibia's uh, relevant authorities, the Minister of uh, Environment and Tourism and others who are involved in that space? Are they approving each one of your steps uh, as far as, I mean, as, as the project continues to, to progress? Absolutely. We are involving every element of the Ministry of Environment in every aspect of what we do, whether it's uh, wells, seismic, um, making sure that our assessments are done in parallel with theirs. Realize that we have our own uh, uh, wildlife assessment going on. We've hired a, uh, someone, a very capable uh, ex-ministry employee to conduct wildlife surveys, and we're doing that in conjunction with uh, the, the, the Ministry of the Environment. So we have to make sure that we're going that extra step. Um, to understand wildlife, and we're doing the same thing for water. We have our own hydrogeologists working very closely with uh, the, the, the Ministry of, uh, of uh, Agriculture on one yeah. water. So, yes, we have a very intimate relationship with all the related ministries. And um, is, um, I mean, obviously the Namibian government is... Um, a shareholder in the project through NAMCOR, which is a 10% shareholder in, uh, in, in that project. And I'm just wondering if um, that has any impact in how government treats your specific project. I mean, knowing that they are shareholders themselves and might be, you know, they are, yeah, they are, they are the, how do, I, how do I put it? Is it... Um, referee and the player at the same time, if I can put it that way. In terms of ob objectivity from the actor, a very important actor in, in that space as our government, 
Do you think um, they are completely honest and, and objective uh, in, in their approval of, of your activities? Well, first off, you know, I've worked in, uh, in the Eastern Hemisphere in areas around Africa, I've worked with many national ministries and governments. And first, the petroleum laws that Namibia has are strong and they're moderate. Um, if you look at the range of, of petroleum laws in Africa, Middle East or other places, you know, Namibia has a very well established petroleum uh, basis uh, for law. So that's managed by the, uh, the, uh, the MME, the Ministry of Mines and Energy. Um, and they are, if you will, the stewards of the data. So Recon Africa doesn't know that data it, it gathers. That data is owned by the government. And when, when we use it, when we send cores off for analysis, we get permission uh, from the MME. So that, <laughs> I can guarantee you that that is a strong agency and we are very, very actively involved uh, up and down with the ministry itself. Now, NAMCOR is the national oil company. And this is a common setting, you know, if you look at other uh, petroleum producing countries, you have the, the ministry, which, you know, essentially the government agency, and then the national oil company, which actually is the partner. So yes, by the uh, petroleum laws, uh, NAMCOR has a 10% working interest in the project, but we pay for that working interest until the time at which production uh, arises and uh, then it goes to a, to a, back to a 10% share being paid. So to me, in working with a lot of different governments, the petroleum laws and, and NAMCOR themselves are, uh, are first class in terms of the organization I've worked with in other parts of the uh, of the world, Eastern Hemisphere, Latin America, you name it. So I feel that the many people, A, are the stewards and owners of this resource and they make the decisions uh, ultimately what happens, and B, that they have a well set up uh, mechanism in their government and in their national oil company. Hmm. The, the one thing, the buzzword that has been thrown in every sentence where Recon Africa appears is fracking. Uh, a lot of people thinking that uh, Recon is not completely honest and open about that uh, aspect. Uh, someone actually suggested recently that uh, Recon has never gone on record to rule out fracking. Uh, are you prepared, uh, Mr. Evans, tonight uh, to go on record and say that is out of question, it will never happen, or is it actually a possibility? Well, there's, as I said many times, we're here because we're looking for conventional reservoirs. Um, if you look at any basin in the world, you go look next door up in soil, you know, in the Eastern Hemisphere, all, you know, 99% of the oil and gas is from conventional reservoirs. And what's that mean by conventional reservoirs? That means you will drill a well like into the oil field uh it produces under natural flow and then the uh as the wells get older you use pumps so no fracking is not necessary we have not applied for it we're not asking to use it we have no equipment for it it's just not into the, pl the, the plans of recon africa and you know frankly that's another thing that can be controlled by the sovereign there are nations that ban fracking there are nations that that welcome it the big debate, uh, but in the case of Recon Africa, we have no interest in it whatsoever. Uh, it, it's expensive, it, it takes water, it, it doesn't make any sense for us. So no, we don't have any intention of fracking. Uh, that's not our business model and that's not what we see uh, in, the, in uh, this program. Yeah, the, there was uh, an issue, uh, Scott, also a couple of months ago about uh, your water drilling activities uh, in uh, in Kavango East. Uh, there were even allegations that um, there were no permits issued in that regard. And, <clears throat> and maybe that is also why so many questions get thrown, uh, thrown at, at your company. Uh, what exactly transpired in that regard and what, what can you tell us about it? What is the status now? Well, the status is that we uh, have acquired, um, we have water permits for all the past, present, and future wells. Um, in the case of uh, the, if we'll say, uh, drilling wells, the wells with the coral gas, we have permits for four. 
Um, we have some previous uh, community wells that we have now uh, correctly and, uh, and all of our future, these future wells are taken care of. We began the Walbert curving process uh, you know, back when we first put in for the, uh, the drilling programs. We've been working with the uh, Ministry of Agriculture to ensure that things are done correctly. And now that is all taken care of. We have all our permits. Uh, we have everything rectified, and we are in good shape. Was it uh, was it an oversight, or what 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 what, um, what led to the drilling without permits in the first place? Well, the, the permits were there. Yeah, the question was, you know, uh, at what you know whether we, uh, but the the amount of water we were taking was, was quite small. An oil, an oil well, if you will, conventional well, we use less water than is needed for a. Uh, uh, community. So uh, I think basically we did the work through the process of the Minister of Agriculture. We we're going through COVID times. Now it's all uh, been taken care of and we have the process in place uh, going forward. We're both working together um, on what is the first onshore drilling project since the 60s in, in Namibia. Yeah. Um, then we have the other issue of uh, there are pockets of discontent, if you will. Um, among uh, communities around around the project, I mean, there are people who think that uh, their crop fields are being uh, targeted for, uh, or will, they will actually lose them. Just in terms of how how are you how are you handling that that aspect of the business, especially knowing that uh, perhaps, of course, the the project, if it was. Uh, if it's compliant to all the regulations, will be actually a huge uh, thing for the region. Um, and therefore, when you start weighing the pros and cons, uh, uh, I'm sure a lot of people would say, yes, let's proceed with the project. But also, without not, I mean, obviously, you still have to consider the views of uh, those people. Um, how are you handling those voices of dissent? Um, Compensations, or what kind of conversations are you having with them? Well, we obviously start with working with the governors, the traditional authorities, and then the community leaders, the community associations, um, to make sure that we communicate clearly what our plans are, what our intentions are, and what the impact uh, can be to the to the people of Kavango. So we are in a constant engagement process. You know, we have an office in Rundu now. We have actually for quite a while. And there's all the stakeholders are, are being managed. Um, now, in terms of uh, land itself, you know, obviously there's a process you go through, you know, working with traditional authorities, the community leaders, making sure that we understand where all the community forests are. And this occupational rights process starts with getting that, that consent. So, uh, we are engaged every day with that, and in, and in fact have uh, have, have been so. You know, in terms of the future for the, uh, the region, in terms of jobs, you know, we have uh, a management team in in Recon Africa that is 100% Namibian. So these are college educated, high impact individual jobs. We have middle management, you know, technical people in particular um, that are out working with the ministries and working with the rigs. And then we have uh, folks in the community. Uh, for example, with the seismic acquisition, there's quite a bit of jobs that will be provided to the community for uh, helping with the seismic as, we, as the seismic trucks move through their areas. So we're probably about 200 uh, plus or minus employees uh, in Namibia right now. And we see that continuing. And, you know, there's a lot of parts of the world where a Canadian company that you can see a very good harmony between tourism, uh, oil and gas, and agriculture. And Western Canada, where uh, Recon hails from, that's a, an excellent example. So we're bringing those kind of principles and that level of community engagement to the Kavango. Um, and again, we're fully committed to working currently with all the communities, landowners, and regional traditional authorities, and making sure that all expectations are met and all jurisdictions, our regulations are honored. Yeah. The, as we draw towards uh, the close of this conversation, Scott, um, give me, I mean, you're, 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 
you are a seasoned executive, you are in charge of uh, the organization. And um, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, in your view, why is there so much uh, um, opposition within <clears throat> those circles that uh, constantly continue to throw uh, sand or mud at you and saying, you are not a legitimate organization, you have, a, you have uh, unholy uh, intentions. Just to what exactly do you attribute that? I mean, that can't be just coming out of nowhere. There ought to be something behind all that. Well, what is your assessment? Um, we are a very uh, experienced group of individuals, whether it's from the uh, uh, ESG perspective, whether it's from the oil and gas perspective. Uh, we have a uh, reconnaissance energy in Namibia, which is 100% Namibian uh, operated and run uh, entity. Uh, Oil and gas is in a, we're in a transition from an energy perspective. Um, but the bottom line is that the people of Namibia and Botswana, you know, through the traditional authorities, governments, and regulatory agencies are going to determine, you know, how they manage this resource. You know, my goal is to make sure that all the information is there so that the decisions can be made. Is there oil and gas in, uh, in the Kavango? Is it economic? You know, these are all the processes. The questions we're we're pursuing, you know, we believe in the project, but ultimately, you know, the people of the Navy decide the fate of this. It's a sovereign question, and so uh, that's you know that's the view we've taken all along. That's the view that every uh, country that I've worked in takes. It's a sovereign question: how it is is determined by the people of the country. Yes. Then the final question to you, uh, Mr. Evans, is then um, <clears throat> obviously uh, the fact that uh, in Africa, I mean, the, the question of foreign domination of African resources, if I can put it that way, continues to, to be topical uh, on the African continent. And um, your project is not exempted from that kind of scrutiny where people think the 10% owned by the people of Namibia is uh, a water, is a drop in the ocean. Um, what are the long-term plans of making your project uh, more inclusive, especially if you make that one breakthrough that you are looking for of uh, eventually starting to extract oil in Namibia? If that happened to, to occur, are there any plans at all to say um, how can Namibia gain more uh, stakes and, and shareholding into the project uh, going forward? I mean, like I say, there's a very strong existing petroleum set of petroleum laws in Namibia. Um, they are, uh, like I said, world class. As we, you know, remember there are several phases to, to this project. There's, if you will, the stratigraphic early exploration phase where we are right now, there's the exploration phase, and there's a the production phase. Um, and so those phases are all defined uh, in the petroleum laws, and we plan on honoring those laws. From the country's perspective, my experience has been that the sooner we have a local organization, and I mean local by not being run by expats parachuting in and parachuting out, uh, an organization that's run 100% by Namibians, and that we hire the best and then train the others to fill in the roles that are, say, more technical. When, from, when, if that's on the ground from the very beginning, and that's been our goal, and that's where we are today, the product of Namibia is 100% staffed by Namibians, and they make the decisions. We have they we have bank accounts, we have leases. That's the that's the you know, uh, company that's making decisions in Namibia. That's how the, the country benefits, and that's how things move best going forward. You know, making sure that the million people run this country company and that they're making the decisions in conjunction with the government, traditional authorities, and leaders. Indeed. Uh, Scott Evans, he's the CEO, the Chief Executive Officer of Recon Africa, speaking to us from Texas about uh, the, his company's activities in Namibia amid so many uh, claims of. Uh, 
unconventional means of doing business in Namibia. He was clarifying some of those things from the perspective of his company. Uh, uh, Mr. Evans, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We appreciate your time, sir. Yeah, I appreciate your time. Have a, have a good evening and please stay safe. Thank you.